Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much for joining us. Uh, my name is Trevor White, and I am the director of the Little Museum of Dublin, and you are watching Santa Rita 120 Dublin Stories. I am deputising for our normal host, Sarah Costigan, who is on her holidays uh, this week, well within her 5K, uh, I uh, stress, um, but uh, it's my privilege uh, to be joined this evening uh, by uh, three authors of a brilliant history uh, of Fanagan's Undertakers. Uh, Fanagan's, this is the book uh, in question, it's called Fanagan's of Dublin, and it tells the remarkable story of the 200 year history of a business, a Dublin, great Dublin uh, firm of undertakers that has prospered uh, through some very tumultuous times uh, in the history of the city. And I'm delighted uh, to be joined, as I say, by its authors, uh, by John Fanagan. Good evening, John. Hi, Trevor. You're very welcome. Uh, by Alan Fanagan. Hello, Alan. Trevor, good evening to you and to all those watching. Thank you very much for joining us. And to Charlie McCarthy. Good evening, Charlie. Good evening, Trevor. So uh, to start, gentlemen, I'm going to ask John maybe to set the scene for us by telling us a little bit about your namesake, John Fanagan, uh, and about his life, please. OK, Trevor. Um, <clears throat> we don't know a huge amount about, uh, about John, except that he, in the year 1819, he was listed as a carpenter and coffin maker uh, operating from 91 Cook Street in the Liberties. And um, he, he uh, we know where, where he is buried, but we know that uh, his cousin, James Fannigan, took over the business uh, uh, nine years later in 1828. And James Fannigan was the father of our, well, really, the, the, the giant of Fannigan's history, William Fannigan, who was born in uh, 1826. Uh, so, and, and when, but, but when his father died, um, he was uh, he was only a boy of four. So we assume that his his wife, his widow, uh, and uh, looked after the business till William took over. William uh, was, as I say, the, the giant of Fannigan's. He was uh, he lived until nineteen hundred and five, and. Unlike my two esteemed colleagues, I, I never was involved with the business. I had a career as a teacher, but I was quickly fascinated by the project. And um, one thing that made the link with the past easier to explore was that William Fannigan, who would have been, would be 195 if he were alive today. When we started this project, five of his grandchildren were still living. And two of them are still living today. One age 96, the other 103. And from them, uh, one of the things I did for it was, was interviewed them on tape to have their recollections of um, William Fannigan's widow, Julia, who was their granny, Gragra they called her, and uh, lived in a uh, house in Wainsford in Kimmage. Uh, until she died in 1932. So um, John Fannigan, uh, the founder, uh, it was his uh, cousin James's son William who really uh, put the uh, business on the map, moved it to Anger Street, still its headquarters, in 1857. Uh, but of course, the the business has greatly expanded, as I, I know uh, Charlie and Alan will be probably talking about. Thank you, John. Just to just on the question of the coffin maker, you say that he set up business as a coffin maker. I, I'm very struck by this idea that actually, you know, we imagine that undertaking is a very old profession. But am I right in saying that there wasn't actually a word for the job that John Fannigan wanted to do? Well, set up? I, I'd have to defer to Alan and Charlie there about when the term. Hmm came into use or because it's, as you as you say Trevor it certainly wasn't used hmm. back in 1819. Alan maybe you'd pick up the story at, at that point please and maybe address that question. 
Well, <clears throat> Cook Street was known as Coffin Street, believe it or not, because there were many carpenters there at the time uh, who made coffins solely. And if bereavement occurred um, within the family, you went to um, Cook Street, go to your coffin maker, select a coffin and bring it home yourself. That used to be the way it was carried home on a two-wheeler cart. Um, and the family did a great deal of the arrangement, in fact, all the arrangements, which is very basic. Um, it is only in latter times that um, the undertaker came into being where he took responsibility um, over from the family and coordinated the, the entire uh, funeral arrangements. Great, thank you. Um, and maybe tell us a little bit, Alan, about uh, about William Fanagan, this this figure who, jo as John says, is really the kind of the key figure then in, in terms of the development of the business and indeed the Julia, the second Julia, as I understand it. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, William Fanagan was was a very successful businessman. He was a politician. He 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 also um, at one time was the High Sheriff of Dublin. Um, but uh, following his death, um, his, his wife, um, his second wife, um, a, a very formidable lady, um, a capable person who took um, the business under her wing and expanded it enormously. She was the one who um, had great foresight and was able to use the assets of her deceased husband to expand into other areas and property in the city. So we owe um, Julia Goodwin um, Fanagan a great deal because she was the one who was responsible for a lot of the advancement during that era. Mm. And just tell us a little bit about the move then, the, the geography of this, because we start in Cook Street and then we move, I think, is it to Anger Street? Or is no, not, Street. Me not immediately. Um, uh, we moved within Cook Street from one address to another and then to Francis Street. Francis Street. Francis Street. Um, the, 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 the old Dublin restaurant used to be the um, former premises. Uh, um, I'm sure many of the patrons didn't realise that when they were having sumptuous <laughs> dinners in that well-respected restaurant. Then we went to Camden Street. Um, and the dates, I just don't have them on the tip of my uh, tongue. And then to Angel Street. Okay. And then to Angel Street, where we still are. And that's where it's our head office and um, controls all the activity. Okay, thank you. Um, Charlie, maybe you'd come in at this point and tell us um, a little bit about your own involvement in the business and, and how you got roped into uh, assisting in the production of this book, please. Well, maybe not roped in exactly, but uh, I worked in Cork with a, a funeral director of Al O'Connor, now deceased, and we had sort of notions maybe above our station, and we came to Dublin to meet three the three Fanagans who ran the company at the time, one being William Fanagan, Alan Stad, John Fanagan, John Stad, and David Stad. And Joe Fanagan, uh, who is only recently deceased. So we met and discussed with the Fanagans uh, the possibility of us in Cork coming up to take over the Fanagan operation. Uh, and the discussions went quite a long way, uh, but eventually the Fanagans decided that if they were going to give this business over, it would hardly be to a bunch of guys from Cork. So, <laughs> it, interestingly, uh, I st stayed on in Dublin with, with uh, my uh, employer from Cork, who had another business running in Dublin, but it wasn't really for me. So, a couple of years later, in 1973, I went back to Fanagan's and mentioned that I was interested to get back in some involvement in the funeral business, and if they were interested uh, in having me, I'd be very interested uh, to join them. Now, they were obviously faced with a dilemma. Here was this guy who two years previous had tried to uh, encourage them to sell their company and me now coming along to uh, look for a job in, in the company. Uh, 
the interview was very interesting, uh, as you might have thought. It took place in in John Fannigan's home in 39 Butchie Park Road at the time, where uh, three bottles of uh, uh, of ale, I'm not quite sure whether they were carling or whatever it was at the time, um, and uh, a glass of whiskey for uh, one of the uh, directors, obviously. And we had a discussion and they decided to take a gamble and they said, yeah, okay, we'll, we'll take you on. That was in 1973 and uh, things uh, went on from there and uh, Alan's father tragically died shortly after that. And the company was, uh, and he was the prime mover of the business, obviously, since he was 19 years of age when his father had died before him. Um, uh, an interesting thing, the Fannigan family had been uh, badly, badly struck with the TB at the time. A couple of them uh, had suffered seriously from TB and uh, uh, destroyed a lot of them, really. It's in the book uh, as to what and who they were and how it happened. But um, we then uh, were in a bit of a dilemma. Alan obviously took over from his father, but we were kind of young people, but we decided, look, let's have a go and, and let's try and expand this business because it had a huge sort of catchment and it had a huge uh, well of, 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 of goodwill from the public because of the way it conducted this business. And we started then to, uh, it was with Davis, Paul, who now deceased, but Paul was in the business at the time I joined, but he didn't want to stay there and David came in in his place. So you had Alan, David, John and Joe, and I suppose myself included. And we set out on what you might call an acquisition or an expansion program and the company grew enormously from there and spread right out into uh, uh, the Fingless, Tala, uh, Dundrum, it's Donny Brook. It's in. It's it's. Uh, and th and then we acquired subsequently um, uh, Edward Nichols' business down in in, in Lombard Street, uh, and Brian Carnegie's business out in 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 Monkstown. And then we uh, acquired uh, later uh, Kerwin's business across in Fairview. So the company now has quite a reach in the city and. Uh, uh, we were blessed, obviously, with uh, the people that worked in the operation. And I found myself in 1980 being invited as the first non-family member to join the board of the company, which I personally considered an enormous, an enormous uh, uh, pleasure. And and and, and uh, we then, when we saw we were coming there, this 200th anniversary. Uh, Alan said, look, we better put this down in, in, in paper because when we're gone, uh, nobody will kind of have the connection, as John described it, back to the elders of the company who, when you consider they brought the company through uh, the famine, the First and Second World Wars, and the upheaval of the 1916 rising and 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 the subsequent war of independence. And it was a, a, a difficult time in the city. And the city itself was going through numerous convulsions uh, over that period. And Fannigan's uh, were involved in all of those convulsions in a different way because uh, death uh, is, is a common denominator. So everybody is, is, is going to uh, be involved in it or have some connection with it. And the uh, Fannigans were there to help those who did have. Mm. Thank you, Chuck. Hey, Trevor. Yes, John. So, I, I just wanted to put in a little plug there. If anyone wants to read up about these events that Charlie has so admirably summarized, um, the book is not for sale, but a copy is in every library in Dublin city and county if anyone wants to follow up on this. Just wanted to let people know if they were interested. Thank That's you, where Bob. you can be um, I want to just return to, to, to an observation that Charlie made there about the tumultuous events that the book chronicles. 
it strikes me that one of the one of the real characters in this book is Dublin itself. And I just wonder for you, John, in the writing of it, um, what are the highlights of this story for you? Give us a sense of how the life of the city maybe sort of weaves in and out of this story of Fanagans. Well, what, one, of, one of the things that did fascinate me was, uh, Alan uh, referred to it in passing, was the role our uh, William Fanagan, Alan's and my great grandfather, the role he played in the politics of the city. Because uh, for almost 25 years uh, until his death, he was a, a, a nationalist member of Dublin City Council. Since the Act of Union, we had no parliament, no forum uh, in, in, in Ireland. Uh, it was all in Westminster. And, but Dublin City Council served an important role there. And in addition to running his business, obviously very successfully, he attended hundreds and hundreds of meetings uh, uh, of Dublin City Council and organised uh, Parnell's funeral, uh, among other uh, important duties. Uh, but uh, for me, uh, I, I, you know, there, there were small human stories uh, that, that, that came out in the writing of this. And getting back to your remark about Dublin being a character, we didn't, when we started, I think Alan and Charlie would probably agree, we didn't have any idea of how the final book with the history would look but we found as you say that Dublin itself was such an important element just as important as you know the big figures in the in the family history. Hmm. I'm going to quote if I may uh, just one passage from from the book which will give our viewers a sense of the rich uh, details when and and, and, and I suppose the role that it played in the social and cultural history in the city. And that's the, the, the funeral of Charles Stuart Parnell, which of course is, is one, of the, one, of the, one of the major events of, of its era. Uh, and um, we learn in the book that an elderly horse called Home Rule walked behind the hearse with its boots, with boots reversed in the stirrups. Uh, and you write, and I quote, this is, this is an age old tradition whereby a single riderless horse accompanies the funeral procession with a pair of boots in the stirrups, toes pointed backwards. It symbolizes a fallen leader facing his troops. Now, I think that's such a powerful image, such a poignant symbol. Mm. Um, and, and, and again, as I say, one of these one of these telling details that the book is, is full of. Um, I would remind our viewers that you're very welcome to ask questions. Please don't hesitate uh, to ask questions of our guests. I note that there is one from from Ben uh, Daly McKenna. Why wasn't there a word for coffin maker in the 19th century? Does anybody want to address that? Well, there was a word. It was coffin maker. Coffin maker. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, I, I, yeah. I, yeah. I suppose the difficulty is, is is that word undertaker, and when when does that emerge? Really, maybe that's a more pertinent question. Yeah, in way, is it that that uh, we don't have? And where does it actually come from? Forgive my my ignorance, but what 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 is it? What is the etymology of that term undertaker? Does any any of you know? Well, I presume it's uh, it's or it would be somebody who undertakes the business of. Of the funerals, I don't know that it's used much now, Alan and Charlie. Is it? I mean, is it more funeral director now? Well, I think the the um, the term undertaker is still the term that's used mostly, mm -hmm. and the major major companies um, uh, throughout um, Britain and Ireland would use um, the term funeral director. Mm -hmm. um, it encompasses everything. Um, and bearing in mind that there could be up to 15, uh, you know, um, different areas for every funeral that have to be catered for. Um, so it's quite a complex issue. Um, the constituent parts of a funeral vary from one case to the next. Um, I won't go into all the detail, but, but uh, so funeral director, because that was part of the undertaker's job was to conduct the funeral to uh, see the vehicles um, uh, were positioned correctly, firstly to bring the family um, together and direct the entire operation, mm -hmm. including uh, at the cemetery. Mm. 
and originally, of course, the the uh, horses were hired. I think am I right in saying that to 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 convey the the coffin to to the uh, cemetery from the church? Would that would that be typically? Yeah, well, it, it would be it would be the case. Um, uh, but in the case of the Fanagan family, they had their own horses. Uh, they had um, um, the facility to uh, have them out grazing. They worked for a fortnight. Um, they grazed for a fortnight um, on the farm in, in Wainsford. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, uh, when we were busy, so our, um, our, our, our own our herd of horses or animals were insufficient, well then we had to hire from others. Mm -hmm. And the same prevails today where we have motorised vehicles obviously. Mm -hmm. And if the work uh, requirement dictates, well we will hire from other funeral companies in the city or in the county. I want to just stick with the role of the undertaker for a moment, if I may, and maybe I'll come to you, Charlie. What are the most common misconceptions that people have about <laughs> the role? It, well, there are a lot of misconceptions. Uh, one question that you're frequently asked is, uh, do you burn the coffin uh, as a cremation? And the answer is, you, obviously you do. Yeah, yeah, uh, coffins are cremated along with the, with the deceased. Uh, other questions are, um, would you ever have buried anybody alive? To which the answer, of course, is no. But people ask the question. And uh, other, things, uh, other things are, uh, like, does it affect you being a, a funeral director or an undertaker having to deal with death every day as, as, your, as your job or livelihood. And it, it doesn't, it certainly wouldn't have affected me, but, uh, and I know the same with some of my colleagues, but, but you learn to, to discover that you're actually helping people uh, in a very difficult uh, situation in their lives uh, through uh, a, a whole set of procedures that they uh, have to go through uh, and you're, you're helping them and just guiding them along. Mm. Uh, and the funeral business is no different than any other business. It has its own uh, HR difficulties, staff problems, uh, and all the related bits and, and pieces. It has its own set of overheads and, 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 and so on and so forth. Uh, what it does have, it's a little bit uh, like a fire brigade operation that you have to explain to people. Uh, you could have four funerals laid out for a particular morning and somebody comes in the door and says, I want the funeral for uh, Monday morning. And you have to then reorganize all your bits and pieces because you just, you just uh, uh, have to, wherever possible, look after the people's, uh, people's requests. And so one other thing that used to scare us quite a bit uh, was the death notices that we put in for people, because if there's a mistake in the death notice, it can be a, a quite problematical. Mm -hmm. And I would say to people, it's very difficult. They say, well, why would that worry you? Well, I said, if Mrs. Brown asked you to paint the wall red and she didn't like the red that you painted it, she can certainly come along and ask you to change that and paint it green. A death notice you cannot change once it has been published. And it's quite, it, it can cause families, and obviously rightly so, severe difficulties if it's not correct. Nowadays, it has been streamed quite a bit more and uh, the, the advent of emails and et cetera have allowed us to have a printout and, a, and, and, and we can see what, what's actually going to be printed in the newspaper. Uh, over the years, some little bits have been printed on the paper that weren't very complimentary to people uh, by pure accident, but uh, I don't think we should go into that <laughs> here and now. Okay. Uh, Trevor, a, uh, just a quick question. A couple, a question and a comment appeared on the screen. Do, yeah. do we address those at the end or what? what? Oh, ha happily, go ahead. Well, go well, ahead. No, what, what one, one remark was about the, the riderless, mm. uh, the boots. 
they said it was at Ronald Reagan's funeral. It was also very famously at JFK's funeral, you know, the, the riderless horse. But the question that came up from somebody who lives in the area said, where was Waynesford? It, was a, it had a huge part in our family, uh, Alan's father and mine growing up. But it's, um, it's where there are eight roads, I think, named. It's, it's where all of those roads named Waynesford are. And it was beside the Holy Ghost Fathers. It adjoined, it was the adjoining estate to the Holy Ghost Fathers in Kimmage Manor. Thank you very much, John. Um, Alan, I want to return um, to our conversation the other day, just in preparation for this, because I asked a question and, and I just, I'd be grateful because I was talking about it with my wife earlier and we both agreed. It was just a fascinating perspective on this. I had asked you um, whether the fact that you attend so many funerals has changed your own attitude uh, to mortality and to the business of living and dying. Uh, and I wonder whether you'd be good enough just to share your, your answer, please, again. Well, in truth, <clears throat> yeah, it, every, case, every case is different. And, and that's the, the amazing thing about the nature of the funeral work we carry out. We do, you might say, the same thing every day. It's not true. Yes, we will arrange for the funeral and, and the eventual burial or cremation. But what happens in, from first call to that stage um, um, can vary hugely from one family to the next. That's what makes it interesting. Mm. Um, uh, and to answer your question directly, um, by being able to assist um, so many at their time of difficulty over a three or four or five day period, um, and do so successfully um, is, is, is quite an achievement. Small, you might think, but in fact, to coordinate all the, um, the requirements and for that to work successfully is what we endeavor to achieve. Our attention to detail is vital. But to come back to the question that you asked specifically, no, it hasn't changed my view uh, on death. Um, I, I, I believe when our time up here is, is up, um, we're gone. Uh, I, I have specific um, instruction left as to what's to happen to me and how that's to be done. And we would encourage people to make advanced preparation and to indeed make their family aware as to what their wishes would be. Mm -hmm. So that it's not a problem when the event strikes and everybody is in turmoil. Mm -hmm. So um, no, it, doesn't, it hasn't affected me. I'm quite clear in what I want. And, and, where, and so my family know, my solicitor knows. So I really would encourage people to think about what is um, an eventuality that we can't change. Yeah. Thank you so, very much. Yeah. Um, there's a comment that's come up, um, which I, I, I better read quickly. Uh, I don't want to get into trouble with John, who I should tell you, ladies <laughs> and gentlemen, uh, I had the privilege of uh, being uh, in a boarding school at which John was my deputy head uh, deputy housemaster. Is that, is that your formal? Yeah, name? yeah. I think it was, yes. Uh, so John has literally put my, my lights out uh, in, in years gone by. That is, you have turned the lights off in my dormitory, John. And it was, <laughs> it was a great, great pleasure to, uh, to have you uh, in that role in my life. And, and it's such a pleasure to, uh, to uh, indeed to stay in touch and to be... Uh, Thank you, Trevor. Talking to you today about this uh, wonderful, wonderful book. Um, a comment uh, which Gabriel McGovern makes, if I might share a memory uh, that to this day brings a smile to my face, and that is my family have always used Fanagans for family and relative Yay! funerals. Uh, and I had been into Anger Street on several occasions to arrange a family or relations funeral. And Charles McCarthy told me that I had been so often into Anger Street, arranging <laughs> a funeral, that they were thinking of starting to invite invite me to the staff Christmas party. <laughs> I, I even smile <laughs> when I pass Anger Street today, going into Whitefriar Street Church. Lovely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There, that, there that speaks to the to the affection uh, in which the business is held uh, by a great many Dubliners. Um, there, there, there aren't too many people that you could make a comment like that to unless you knew them uh, particularly well, I would have to say, uh, Trevor. And another question arose, or was on the screen there. Uh, some, somebody asked the question, are coffins uh, made 
in Ireland or are they imported and does Brexit have an effect? Well, coffins uh, up to uh, the, late, uh, the early 90s, Fannigans made a lot of their own coffins. Uh, they still made them. Uh, yes, coffins are made in Ireland and there are maybe three companies, I won't name them uh, particularly, but there are three companies at least that make coffins in Ireland. And it's fair to say that 90, 98% of all the coffins used uh, by Fannigans over the years have always been manufactured here in Ireland. And Brexit really won't have uh, any impact on, 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 on coffin production in, in the country, really. Mm. Um, a related question, uh, how has the business changed in the time? I mean, you talk, you talk, Charlie, 1973, you go back quite a way. You know, how has the, the business of, of, of organising funerals changed? So, for example, are you seeing a lot more humanist funerals today? Are there a lot more cremations? You know, what are the trends within, within the business itself? Yeah, well, it has changed. It has evolved. Like uh, the only thing that's constant anywhere is change, and the business has changed uh, in in uh, in many ways. Uh, even in the way we would now deal with families, there's a lot of online uh, stuff. I mean, you can show families coffins online. You can uh, uh, have different conversations with them where heretofore they'd have to be on your premises to see the actual coffin that they may choose. Uh, it has changed in that respect. It, it, cremations have grown in, in the country uh, quite dramatically. Uh, I can remember way back when I started first, uh, cremations where there was, there, was, there was no crematorium in, 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 in the country. The only one was in Belfast, in, in Roselawn in Belfast. And occasionally we would have to send a, a deceased there for a cremation, but the cremation has changed. And then the, the humanist uh, type funeral uh, has come in, obviously. Uh, and the removal uh, of the deceased to church before a funeral service has practically uh, ceased. Uh, and then in the 73, the funeral home wasn't really uh, in vogue very much in Dublin, but it started to grow from then on, and, and uh, it has, uh, it, some would say it has sort of come maybe full circle in some cases, that people are going back to their own homes, where the deceased has been brought back to the, its own, their own home, uh, prior to going to church for the funeral service, be it a mass or a, or a service of whatever denomination the next morning. So all these things happen. Uh, uh, and and the, the, uh, the, the, the horses have obviously disappeared with the, 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 some exceptions, but the business has evolved in the same way you could say as most other things have evolved around us. Yes. Um, I just on that question of the horses disappearing, I was very uh, amused by uh, a description in the book of a man called Tommy Cronin. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure uh, uh, whether uh, any of you are old enough to remember Tommy Cronin. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. Oh, yes. Who joined, oh, yes. Fannigan, yeah. joined Fannigan's at the age of 14 in 1920 <clears throat> and spent his life working in the business. And he was often teased, uh, it says in the book, for having a horse while his younger colleagues drove cars, uh, to which his reply was always the same. He said, you never have to put a horse up on a ramp. <laughs> that was a very good answer. Um, Alan, I'd like to ask you the same question, if I may, just in relation to the, the changing nature uh, of the role itself and the, the trends that you've seen emerging, perhaps in, in recent years, well, if we go back just a little while, back to 68, when I was, a, I was a travel agent selling holidays to all parts of Europe. And um, a death occurred in the business. Um, the manager died and, and Billy, John and Joe, in their wisdom, said we must look to the family for maybe um, the next generation to be considered. And... Um, my hat was in the ring. Um, uh, my father was a bit reticent. 
um, but my uncles have heard some positive things and um, I was interviewed by my two uncles and got the job. That was 1968. And they sent me away to, to learn how to embalm. I became the first embalmer in the, comp in the company. There were very few in the country at that time. Um, and it took many years following uh, the qualification to persuade the older generation that this was very much part of the presentation of the body. Mm -hmm. And, and, and um, now all cases in all major funeral companies are prepared and, and presented in the most natural state possible for the family to see um, their loved one before uh, the funeral. Mm -hmm. So that took a long time and, 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 and um, to change the view of uh, the seniors in the, in the, in the family. But um, eventually it, it, was, it was passed, it wasn't a problem. But as Charlie's touched on the arrival of cremation in the country, which uh, was a slow process because uh, initially um, the church wasn't in agreement, but we've overcome that. But I think the biggest um, change in recent years has been the advent of the same day funeral, as we call it, which would be where the removal to the place of worship uh, and the actual funeral to cemetery or crematorium takes place the same day. There used to be the tradition in um, uh, that, that we would bring the deceased to church the night before, and then the funeral would take place the following day. Now for a myriad of reasons that has changed. And it's changed quite quickly, like over the period of the last eight to 10 years, it has changed substantially in mainly in the cities in, in urban areas the old tradition still prevails so that particularly would be one of the most significant things to happen um, uh, um, in recent in recent years added to the fact that during the pandemic that we're presently experiencing um, we find that the the, the same day funeral is the case for everybody with only 10 people in attendance, it's very difficult, it's worse than awful for, for families. So whether we go back to what was the traditional way remains to be seen. Yeah. So there are the major changes that have happened over a period of years at the advent, of course, of the funeral home, where the funeral undertaker, funeral director, brought the facility into the uh, suburbs so people didn't have to come to the city centre. It, I could just add to that, Trevor, uh, to, and what Alan said about uh, the pandemic. Um, my, we, my family, lost, we lost our mother. She died uh, a month ago. And we're a very large family and we could only have 10 people in the church. But it was, there are two things, remarks I would make. First, it was um, a very peaceful, dignified and intimate moment. In other words, it wasn't all bad. The other thing is, and I, I'm not sure... Um, how much things the advent of RIP.ie uh, people who would uh, uh, the, the, the flood of messages from people who would otherwise have been at the funeral and you actually have them there you know and you can print them off and keep them so there it, it, not everything is bad even though you know of course we miss for example especially being able to get together mm -hmm. after the burial or the cremation or whatever it is of our loved one, we just have to put those parties on hold, and there's going to be a hell of a lot of them when we get out of this. And John, on mm -hmm. behalf of, of everybody watching, I want to offer our sin sincere condolences. Oh, well, thank you. A very sad time. Thank you. For you. Um, I had, uh, I was at a, a funeral um, a, a couple of months ago, and I was very struck uh, in this particular context by the significance of the role that the that the the undertakers played in a way and uh, they're, they're made much more prominent um, and i wonder whether that's something maybe alan or charlie in your own experience that you've been conscious of since the pandemic started simply because of the the the, the much smaller numbers at funerals it seems in a way to accentuate the significance of the role uh, that you play within the funerals well, I'd just take that, um, <clears throat> that question or, uh, and just answer it simply by saying that our presence is um, very much more noticeable because the numbers are down. 
with only 10 people in attending uh, the, the, the church ceremony, four members of the funeral staff make it 14. And um, so it's very evident that they're present. Mm -hmm. Whereas when there's a larger number of people there, they kind of are not as, um, as, 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 as prominent. So that would be um, very evident that they, that they, are, that they are there. They're always there in the background. It's just that now you see, you see them as, um, as, as they are carrying out their work. Um, uh, another question I had just about the business and more generally, and I just, I, I just want to put this in a larger context. In Dublin, I'm very mindful that there's a relatively small number of families who are prominent or who traditionally has been prominent as undertakers. Is that unusual or is it quite common that in a large city you will, you know, it'll be, it'll be a relatively small number of families who control the, 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 the trade? I would say that um, you'd be surprised at the number of funeral companies that are in Dublin City. Um, you might know um, your, your, you might know a half dozen, mm. but in fact there could be three times that number. Would there be? In fact, I know that there is. Yes, sir. So, so there's quite a lot of um, of funeral directors in their own localized areas, and, and particularly in the county. Um, but in, in in the Dublin city, uh, the same would apply. Mm -hmm. Now, like ourselves, we we have. Um, amalgamated or taken over the other companies, we still trade under their names. Mm -hmm. So, um, and there are some other companies that have done likewise and still trade under the original family name because family loyalty at time of funerals is important. They come back to the same people normally uh, who looked after the previous member of the family. There is that tradition, um, although it's slipping a bit, uh, convenience seems to be the key. And that's why funeral homes are stationed around the uh, periphery of the city and the suburbs mm. uh, to cater for that need. Uh, on that uh, note around loyalty, I was very struck in the book uh, by the, the fact that you had conducted the funeral for Mother Mary Aikenhead, who had, of course, the founder of the St. Vincent's Hospital and of the Religious Sisters of Charity but that to, to this day, you still conduct the funerals uh, for members of that order. That's um, correct. And again, I, I wonder, is that, is that quite typical in its way? Or is that- Well, I think that um, <clears throat> having been there um, at, at, at uh, the very early um, stages, 200 years ago in the city, um, we looked after a lot of communities, um, the orders, um, both nuns and, and priests. And we're proud to say that we still do that today for the majority of um, the clients that were there 100 years plus ago. So yes, the tradition has lived on. Yep. Mm. And, and then another telling detail that I found fascinating in the book itself, um, again, it's really a piece of social history as much as anything is that you, you write about Mother Mary Aikenhead's body being transported in a hearse that was drawn by four black horses with white ostrich plumes. And you go on to say that this is a sort of a final show of opulence, a must have decoration at respectable funerals. And that three or four plumes dem demonstrated moderate wealth, while five or six sort of indicated greater prosperity. Uh, seven plumes were reserved for the very richest citizens. And, and I suppose what I found fascinating is that it, it seems, you know, obviously you can't take your wealth with you, uh, but you could at least remind your survivors uh, of their good, good fortune. And that even the color of these plumes uh, was also significant. So I suppose what, 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 I, what I'm really saying is that it seems extraordinary to me that there is so much detail within the uh, rituals uh, of the service itself um, that many people would have been conscious of and that perhaps today we've lost some of these. Well, one, one thing we haven't lost, we, well, of course we have lost the horses, but we haven't lost the tradition that if you notice that when a priest's coffin is being, is being placed in front of the altar, it's placed head first 
looking down on the community, whereas everybody else, it's feet first. Mm. And when the coffin has been taken from the church and placed within the hearse, it's the same thing. The head goes in first into the, into the, into the vehicle. That is a tradition that has held um, since we began a business. That's fascinating. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to bring the, the conversation to a conclusion, gentlemen, just really by, by asking you all, I'll start with you, John, maybe just to reflect on the experience of this book and maybe what you'd like to leave uh, readers of the book with or people who are watching this evening in terms of a, a, an impression about Fanagans and maybe its role within, uh, within the life of our city. Well, just as an outsider compared with Alan and Charlie, um, it, I first of all, I, I very much enjoyed doing the whole thing, but it gave me great pride in being a member of the Fanagan family that has been so much part of so many lives in Dublin. Thank you very much, Charlie. Uh, <clears throat> the interesting thing um, when you uh, obviously the history I found that fascinating because I did a lot of research about the history of both the city and and the company as it was tied into the various events that uh, were developed over the 200 years but one of the, the real things that struck me was uh, the difficulties that the family encouraged or, or, or encountered rather over the 200 years. When, when James Fanagan died way back in 1832, his wife Anne took over the running of the company and we believe was assisted by John until his death in, in 1837. Uh, and then uh, when when William eventually took the helm uh, and 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 his first wife died, he married again. When he died, his second wife took over in, in 1905 and guided the company right through the First World War and the Civil War and and the uh, War of Independence uh, until her death in uh, 19. 32. And in researching that then, it's something struck me, which I didn't know until I looked at the research. The Eucharistic Congress was held in, in 1932 in Dublin or in Ireland. And she was conscious that she wanted to see the cross or the, the altar for the Congress before she died. Uh, and she was able to do that. But the reason that the Congress was in Dublin in 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 1932 was to celebrate the 1500th uh, anniversary of the arrival of St. Patrick in the country in 432. And then you moved on and in the next generation, uh, uh, William's, William the first son, William the second, he died a young man and he left John and Joe and Billy, his three sons as orphans, their mother had died before that. And they still, Billy, who would be Alan's father, was only 19 years of age, and he was left with the job of trying to keep people in employment and uh, keep a service that the public uh, could buy into. Uh, and he, he managed to do that. And what struck me was the absolute resilience of the family to continue uh, against all the odds, whatever those odds might have been. And that actually continues to this day. There is a resilience required in a family business and everybody would know that family businesses uh, are not an easy uh, uh, game to play unless you have that resilience and that commitment. And thankfully, uh, Fanagans have that. And I found it fascinating to be able to see that from close quarters, really. And that struck me when I was putting the, the bits in the book here together. Very well put. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, Alan, the final word to you. Okay. <clears throat> I, 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 Charlie and I struck a great uh, rapport when Cork tried to take um, Dublin over, uh, going back all that uh, <laughs> many years ago. Um, and then we took on um, the task of 
uh, of, of spreading the wings with the support of Joe and and um, and John, um, and 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 that worked very well. But the fact that we're saddened by <clears throat> the loss of the entire fourth generation took place uh, with Myra's death, and before her, Joe Fennigan, he died on the first of. Of, of February this year, and then um, there, uh, uh, her uh, Joe's only sister, one of the fourth generation Beth, she died in July last year. So that fourth generation is gone. The fifth are um, are, are Alan, uh, David, and Jody, and Jody's now the managing director of the company. Both uh, David and myself had that task for some time, and now we have a sixth generation in the business. Um, with Robert and Daryl, who are my sons that joined the business and Robert is advancing therein. Um, and I just think that it's, um, it's marvelous to think that we've been able to hold it together um, over that period of time through the tricky times when you had a bank that said at one stage to us, we can't honor any more checks. These things we managed to overcome. Um, and there are many other incidents I could speak of, but time is against us. But it's with great pride too that I've been involved in this operation with the rest of my family, cousins, um, uncles, dad for a short place of time, and um, never really had the previous sport, uh, the third generation, they were all gone before I joined. But it's been a great experience. And um, while I'm still involved, um, as uh, David is, uh, we will have some value to the company as the years progress, we would hope. But um, thanks for the opportunity to highlight um, the book, which we enjoyed putting together. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't just the three of us, there are several others who contributed hugely. And if I could pick one out, it's Una Semple. Uh, from her his historical notes on the family, we, we got a great deal of information, um, accurate yep. information, because she was that type of woman. But thank you. Well, it's quite clear to me that your firm has been particularly well served um, by, by each of you. Um, but I also think the story of your, of your firm has been well served by such excellent biographers. This is the book, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, uh, as was said earlier on, it is available uh, in the libraries of Dublin. I have to tell you that we've had various people clamoring for copies of it uh, <laughs> over the last uh, half an hour, 40 minutes, saying where could, you know, they want to buy it, etc. Would we release a PDF of it? Uh, and so on. So I should warn you that you will probably be hearing uh, more uh, such demands uh, in, in the future. If you can get hold of it, ladies and gentlemen, I highly recommend it to you. As I say, it is not simply a chronicle of a great uh, Dublin firm. It is a stirring tribute uh, to uh, the resilience and the determination and ultimately uh, to, to the grace and to the decency uh, of a family uh, who have uh, prospered uh, through good times and bad. And um, it's a great, great privilege to have you uh, join us here uh, this evening, gentlemen, to tell us uh, a little bit about this remarkable story. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. Thanks, Trevor. Thank you, Trevor. Thank you, Trevor. Normal thank service you. will be resumed uh, next <laughs> Thursday with Sarah. Uh, until then, thank you and good evening. Well done, Trevor. Thank you. Thank you.